Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Do you know the pattern by now? Christ is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God. Uh, my name is Steve. If we haven't met before, I'm really glad that you came here to worship God and to hear about the hope of Easter. It's a real privilege to get to share this with you today. You know that, that slogan, that Christ is risen response, that goes way back to the ancient church. We had to translate that into English. It goes back so far. There's a more recent, but still kind of a little bit older Christian slogan. I first heard it 30 years ago. I don't really know how far back it goes. Some of you will know it probably when I start it. And it goes like this. It says, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Yep, yep, some of you do know it. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And some of us have testimonies like that in our lives. We know what Friday is. We, we think of Friday as like the Good Friday experience of Jesus, the experience of affliction and hardship and opposition. And while most of us haven't experienced exactly that sort of thing, we do, what we do relate to the darkness and to the affliction and the hardship of life. And we remind ourselves and we claim the victory that even though that is our present reality, yet because of Easter, we say Sunday is coming. And that is a great word of hope. And yet I think there is a little bit of a problem that we struggle with on Easter to allow the hope of Easter in. And I, have, I do this too. I bet a lot of us do this. I think we struggle to let the hope of Easter in past our defenses because sometimes hope can be a vulnerable thing. And so there's another thing that's true, even though it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Isn't it also true that it's Easter, but Monday's coming? <laughs> but Monday's coming. And we get all dressed up for Easter and we have big crowds here and we put on our pastel colors. I sort of maybe didn't quite succeed on that one today. We make our brunch plans for afterward and ready to celebrate a big day. But yet we kind of keep this hope of Easter. We're a little worried and maybe it can't make it through our defenses. And it seems to me that probably for a lot of us at this point in history, at this time in our world, I think we have developed a dysfunctional relationship with hope. We've developed a difficult relationship with hope. We've gotten really good at training ourselves for even getting comfortable with our defenses and with our cynicism. And you can't blame us. I mean, honestly, I think it's fair. So many of the messages that we hear day in and day out, hour in and hour out, almost minute by minute, the marketing messages and the headlines that we read that overpromise and tell you everything is going to be the best thing ever and it's unique and it's going to change your life forever. If you just like use this one weird trick to melt belly fat forever, doctors are terrified. You'll find out. I've, I've never clicked on that. You haven't ever clicked on that either, right? Every, every empty promise, every hero, every public figure and celebrity, maybe not everyone, but every one of us, I bet, has thought there was somebody that we admired or looked up to as a professional athlete. It was a politician. It was a thought leader, whatever on earth that is. It was somebody like that. And then later we found out it just wasn't. They weren't what we thought they were. And we are learning and training ourselves not to hope. And I wish it weren't the case, but I have to admit that it is the case, it has been my experience, it has been many of your experiences, that even church can make this hard sometimes. That sometimes at, at church, we are reluctant to tell the truth, to be open and honest and vulnerable about our Friday and Monday experiences. We just kind of put on our, who Sunday face, and our Sunday best. And then it, we have a hard time connecting the Sunday hope to the Friday and Monday realities. And we don't make the space for and trust in our relationships and take the risk of vulnerability about those harder realities. And even when it happens in a large group of people like the church is, that we hurt one another, and that's always going to happen. But then if we try to paper over that, if we try to gloss over that and aren't honest about that, we just learn the lesson over and over again that like the hope of Easter is fun for Easter, but there's a ditch and there's a chasm and there's a gap between the hope and the joy and the victory and the goodness and the light that we claim on Easter and the dimness or the darkness or the pain or the affliction or the fear that we experience in so many other places. And we'll be like, yeah, it's Easter and that's awesome. But Monday's coming. But Monday's coming. And if you ever struggle with that experience of Easter, if, if that version of Easter feels to you more like make-believe than credible hope, then I think probably we all together are in the place where we are ready to cut through the noise and be able to hear what the witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus said about his resurrection and what it means for us. The first thing that I want you to hear and learn and please remember 
from the story of Jesus' resurrection that we read today is something that all the testimonies to Jesus' resurrection have in common. All four stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they use their own words, they, they say it in their own way as faithful, credible, non-colluding eyewitnesses are prone to do. They tell it in their own way, but every one of them insists on telling us that the hope of the resurrection of Jesus came into this world, broke into this world, while it was still dark. It came while it was still dark. And at one level, that's just the time of day that it was. You say, that's not very significant at all. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of details about the resurrection story that I don't know and nobody does. I don't know what kind of flowers were growing outside the tomb or if there were any at all. I don't know what kind of rock it was cut into or how big the stone was that was rolled away. There are lots of things I don't know. They didn't have to tell us what time of day that it happened, but every one of them in their own way told us that the hope of Jesus broke into the world while it was still dark. And it struck me as I was reflecting on that fact this year that this may have stood out to them. They may have been ready to understand and see the significance of this partly because it had already been their experience of Jesus earlier in their lives, that he had broken into their lives already while it was still dark. It had been for them, for the characters whose names we can learn and stories we can read in the pages of the Bible. It was already for them that Jesus came to them while they still experienced life as outcasts, and rejects, and nobodies, and failures, that Jesus came to them and called them to himself. It was already, while they were still deep in the guilt of their sin and their wrongdoing, and feeling like if they were ever the people that went into the inner sanctum of the temple, or even showed their face around the leaders of the synagogue, the whole place might just fall down around them. That was when Jesus came into their lives, and not afterward. It was in their experiences of pain and sickness and alienation and fear and disease. It was in those moments and not after those moments were already taken care of that the hope of Jesus broke into their lives. And isn't that the testimony, isn't that the experience that a lot of us here have today? And isn't that exactly what we need God to do? It's not after the pain and the disease leave our lives, but right there in the midst of of the appointments and the diagnoses and the scans and the visits in the hospital rooms that we need the hope that doesn't come after everything is shiny and happy but right there in those moments that we need the hope that is greater than anything else we have in this world and that's where it comes from. In our relationships, in our friendships, in our families, if you're a married person in your marriages, it's not after your relationships, it's not after the brokenness and the hurt all just goes away and the relationships magically reconcile themselves that we need the power of God's Holy Spirit to come and take away our hearts of stone toward one another and give us soft hearts and allow us to forgive and reconcile with one another. It's in the darkness where we need the light of Jesus to shine. And you guys, it won't be after our culture finally decides, oh, why don't we just stop our civil war and our hate for one another? It won't be then. It will be in the midst of it that we will need Jesus to come among his people and teach us and lead us and empower us and change us to lay down the hatred for one another and to to bridge across the things that divide us that are causing us literally to kill one another, that Jesus will have to come and teach us how to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and see the image of God in every human being. And it won't be after we just get over all of our sin and all of our addiction and all the things that warp our very lives that we need God to break in. It is in the midst of it that he comes to give us freedom. And it is because they had experienced that and it is because they understood that that's how Jesus works and must work in our lives that they insisted on telling us when they wrote the stories down, when they passed it down from one to another to another to another and then somebody finally wrote all the stories down that if somebody I think ever left out the detail of when it happened in the morning they're like, no, 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 please make sure to tell them that the hope of the resurrection of Jesus happened while it was still dark. They tell us that it was like the dawn. It not only happened at dawn, it was like the dawn of the new creation of God coming in and making possible what otherwise is not. And it is because that is true that they are also able to show us, they are also able to tell us about the women at the tomb and give us an example that it is possible based on the hope of the resurrection of Jesus to learn how to walk through fear with courage and joy. 
I don't know if you saw it in the story. The story is such an amazing story of so many brilliant and powerful things that maybe our minds don't quite catch it. But did you hear how many references to fear there are in the story of Jesus overcoming the grave? There are four references to fear between verses 4 and 10 in this story. The first one happens when it says that the guards saw there was this earthquake and there was this angel who wore clothes that was as bright as lightning. I don't even know what that looks like until I was surprised to see the angel with clothes like lightning sitting out in our lobby up there this morning. And it says the guards who were there to guard the tomb, they, sh- they were afraid. They were very afraid and they shook and became like dead men. And then right away, the angel who was there turns to the women who had come to the tomb to honor Jesus, already coming through their fear. And he says, now don't you be afraid. Like, you can't pass out. You've got to go tell other people about this, right? He says, don't be afraid. And then they go, and on their way, they meet Jesus, who tells them exactly the same thing. Fear not, but go and tell the brothers to meet me in Galilee. But I skipped one reference to fear, and it's actually my favorite one of the four. It's number three. It happens between the angel saying, fear not, and Jesus saying, fear not. It says that the women went, like the angel had said, you have to go out from here. You can't just stay here as much as you might like to. Go out from here. Tell the rest of my disciples to go meet me in Galilee. They'll see me there. And they went in the face of real opposition. And the description, it says, they went fearing and with great joy. (laughs) They went fearing and with great joy. Have you ever heard the, uh, the advice or the saying, do it scared? Have you ever heard that before? They went and they did it scared. And these are the conditions, actually, that make that possible and healthy and brave for us. They were going to go out and tell people about Jesus that all the most powerful people around them had just tried to kill. They were going to go out and share that. They were going to go out in the face of darkness. They were going to go out to lots of people who probably wouldn't believe them. And they went out fearing and with great joy. Friends, there are, you know, I'm not telling you anything. And there are plenty of things in this world. There is plenty of darkness. There are plenty of things that are maybe worth being afraid of. Plenty of fearsome things. Things that you experienced on Friday. Things you might experience this coming Monday. Things you might experience in the car on the way home. I don't know. There's plenty of darkness out there. But here's the thing. Because of the tomb, because of the empty tomb of Jesus, fear doesn't get to control you. Fear doesn't get to deform us It doesn't get to warp us against one another and cause us to hate one another. Fear doesn't get to make our decisions for us. Jesus rose, the hope of the world came while it was still dark. And so we can learn to walk through fear with great joy and with courage. And the reason that all these things are true for us now, 2,000 years later, is because of the last theme that I want you to see in this passage, and it's this. Jesus keeps his promises. Jesus keeps his promises. There's a theme of promise making and promise keeping throughout this story and the verses that follow it. When the angel was saying to the women who came to the tomb to come see Jesus, to try to find Jesus and care for his corpse, for his dead body, and they come there and they're shocked by what they see. They don't understand right away. And the angel explains to them, he is not here. He is risen. And that would have been good enough news all on its own. But do you remember the line right after that? He is not here. He is risen just as he said. He already promised this. He told you it was going to happen. He told you he would overcome the grave. Nobody should have believed it, right? Who's ever overcome the grave before? But Jesus did. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. We find that Jesus is faithful and powerful to keep his promises. And then the angel gives them the commission. We've said it already a couple times. You have to go out and tell the others about this. Go find the rest of my disciples. Go find the brothers and tell them to go meet me in Galilee. And they'll, they'll see me there. And so they go, and they meet Jesus, and he reinforces it. Fear not. Go tell the brothers to go up to Galilee. They will see me there. It might be helpful for you to know that Galilee, if you're not all brushed up on your ancient Near Eastern geography, isn't around the corner from the tomb. It's like 60 miles away. It was a multiple day walk. They had to stake something on this. They had to take Jesus at his word. They had to believe that he keeps his promises. And they went up to Galilee, and lo and behold, they found him there. He was there because he keeps his promises. And they met him there. And then in the last verses, about the last three verses of the Gospel of Matthew, it says that they went and they met him and they saw him and they worshipped him and they doubted at the same time, right? It was all mixed up. Hope comes in the dark. You can walk through fear with courage and joy. They worshipped him. There was faith while there was also still doubt and wonder. And then Jesus made them a promise. And it started like this. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm in charge now. 
I'm in control now over all the darkness that remains in the world, over everything that threatens you. All authority, not only in heaven, but also on earth, is mine. So go tell more people about me. Go draw more people to be my disciples. Teach them all the things that I have taught you. Baptize them. Offer them the forgiveness, the washing away of their sins, and the raising up to new life. And as you do this, in the teeth of all the opposition that you will face, and if you read the next chapters of the book of Acts, you will find there was plenty. But he said in the midst of all the darkness that you will face, Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that is a word that resonates down all the way to our generation, that the risen Jesus will be with us as he has promised. And the truth is, I don't know what everybody's Friday was like, either literally or metaphorically speaking. I don't know what's waiting for you on all of your Mondays and this week and the week that follows. And I know there will be hard things. I know there will be dark places. I know there will be things that are frightening and fearsome. And yet I know the one who walked out of the tomb and said in the midst of all of it, I will be with you there. He has been there and he will be there with you in all of it. The Jesus who said, I know the afflictions you face in this world. In this world you will have trouble. We could say, amen, Jesus, that's true. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And you can bank on that. You can bank on that. Not because you wish it was true. Not because I said it was true but because the one who walked out of the grave says it's true. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your power, for your grace, for your willingness and for your love that you would descend into the darkness and the trouble of our lives. That you would come and call us and bring hope into our lives while it was still dark for us. That's where you meet us. We thank you for your faithfulness all the way to the point of death and worship you for your victory over the grave. Jesus, I pray that you would break down our defenses. That you would heal our dysfunctional relationship with hope and teach us to place our hope in you. Teach us to take the risk of vulnerability to get our hopes up again if they are well placed in you. I pray that you would work in each of our hearts to give us courage and joy, even in the face of the darkness against us. We love you and we trust you and we pray in your name. Amen.